Now, a new effort from former Vice President Mike Pence, who's launching a new campaign to bring energy independence back to America. Joining me right now is the man himself, former Vice President Mike Pence. Mr. Vice President, great to have you this morning. Thanks so much for being with me. Thank you, Maria. Good to be with you. From Israel, in fact. I want to ask you about Israel because I know that the prime minister has spoken with President Zelensky and as well traveled to Moscow. But first, let right. me get your take on this war, Mr. Vice President. We are watching death and destruction every day. Could the U.S. and its allies be doing more to stop Vladimir Putin? Well, Maria, there's a, a truth of history that weakness arouses evil. When you look at the record of uh, this administration, it's almost inarguable that the unilateral capitulation to Russia on Nord Stream 2, on a new START treaty, the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, all created the conditions where Putin uh, felt emboldened uh, to once again try and redraw the lines of Europe by force. But make no mistake about it, uh, the only one to blame for what's happening in the Russian invasion in Ukraine is Vladimir Putin. And Putin must stop or Putin must pay. And it's absolutely imperative. As I met today with the President of Israel, with the Prime Minister of Israel, it's imperative that the free world come together, that we find ways to arm the people of Ukraine to be able to defend their nation and their territorial integrity. And the time has come for us not just to sanction financial institutions, but the time has come to sanction all oil and energy exports from Russia. Energy is the lifeblood of the Russian economy, and we're calling on, on uh, our Congress, we're calling on this administration, and we're calling on nations around the world to join us in, in an international embargo to bring the kind of pressure that we must bring to bear if we hope to stop this mindless, senseless Russian invasion of Ukraine. And yet, the administration has yet to say that. A bill was brought to the floor yesterday in terms of cutting off Russian imports. We don't know when that vote will take place. I'm hearing possibly Wednesday. But the Biden administration is asking our adversaries to pump more oil. He's apparently considering Saudi Arabia, Venezuela. And I want to get your take on this idea that we are imminently going to see a new Iran deal. You just said that you spoke with the leadership in Israel. Uh, the president has talked about potentially getting oil from Iran. What are your conversations about that? Well, uh, there's, there's a great deal of alarm here in our most cherished ally, Israel, over the very idea that this administration continues in, in the midst of a Russian invasion of Ukraine continues to drive to revive the disastrous Iran nuclear deal. And it's even more offensive, Maria, when you think that we're working directly with Russia uh, in, in an effort to revive that deal. It was, it was bad to begin with. It was dangerous at the time. President Trump was right uh, to rip up the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, but now, in the environment that we're in today, the very idea uh, that, we would, uh, that, that we would look to to purchase oil from Iran, to purchase oil from uh, the dictator Maduro in Venezuela, all the while that this administration continues its war on American energy. You know, it is really remarkable, I don't have to tell you, Maria, that uh, in the four years of the Trump-Pence administration, we achieved energy independence for the first time in 70 years. We were a net exporter of energy. But from very early on, with killing the Keystone Pipeline, taking federal lands uh, off the list for exploration, sidelining leases for oil and natural gas, uh, once again, we, before Ukraine ever happened, we saw rising gasoline prices. But so the answer here is, number one, stand firm as, as the United States and have the free world join us in cutting off funds to Russia in their energy exports. We need to put those sanctions on. But at the same moment, President Biden and this administration must unleash American energy and stop going hat in hand to places like Venezuela. I hear that President Biden may be headed to Saudi Arabia to ask them personally to pump more oil. And for heaven's sakes, uh, let's, let's, let's offline any further discussion 
of the Iran nuclear deal for the sake of Israel's security, and frankly, in the recognition that now more than ever, we should not be dealing with the Ayatollahs in Tehran or Putin in Moscow in, in lifting sanctions or pressure that we placed on Iran. What kind of response might we see from Israel if, in fact, we were to see the U.S. back in this Iran deal? Honestly, we're hearing it's imminent. Well, it's, uh, I have to tell you, in, in meeting with the president of Israel this morning, in meeting with the prime minister, uh, Israel's made their position clear that uh, they're categorically opposed to the Iran nuclear deal. There's all kinds of reasons to be. And when, when our administration tore up the deal, it's because we recognize that not only did it not prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, it guaranteed that they would be able to obtain a nuclear weapon in 10 years. But the reality that we would lift sanctions in the immediate short term and see billions of dollars flow in uh, to Iran uh, also will, will continue to, to, to uh, foment the kind of violence that was characteristic of the region before our administration came into office. That's the concern that yep. I heard from leaders and from rank-and-file citizens here in, is in Israel. But beyond all of that, again, uh, Maria, uh, it, the idea that we are negotiating actively with Russia in Vienna to revive the disastrous Iran nuclear deal as their tanks are rolling over innocent civilians and the people of Ukraine is unconscionable. It has to stop. And for all those reasons, this administration should abandon any future effort on the Iran nuclear deal. Let's focus on giving the people of Ukraine the support that they yeah. need to defend themselves. Let's isolate Russia economically, particularly with regard to energy. And for heaven's sakes, let's unleash American energy and, and restore uh, America's role in the world as a, as a leading energy provider. Yeah, it's absolutely extraordinary, Mr. Vice President, that Russia is the mediator uh, of, uh, on behalf of the United States in the Vienna talks. I want to get one more question in, given you are in Israel on this topic, and then move on to how we're going to unleash uh, this energy in America. The CEO of Chevron said that natural gas pipeline from Israel to Europe could help alleviate the shortage. Your thoughts on this potential uh, new idea, a pipeline Israel to Europe? Well, uh, any additional infrastructure investment that allows for the transfer of natural gas, uh, both into Europe and into Israel, would be welcome news. I mean, remember, not only were we a net exporter of, of uh, of oil, but also of natural gas. And, and during our administration, we were actually in discussions with several European countries about improving their ports, improving the ability to import American natural gas. But it's amazing to think that among the missteps of the Biden administration, after we had sidelined the Nord Stream 2 deal, a plan to build another natural gas pipeline from Russia into the heart of Europe, the Biden administration unilaterally approved it. And it wasn't until the Russian tanks were rolling into Ukraine that they pulled back on that. It was a mistake in the very beginning. What we ought to be doing is tying the free world together from the perspective of energy, tying Europe and Israel together, all of that. That's, that's a vouchsafe for the prosperity uh, of freedom in the world. And also, it'll contribute to American prosperity for gen generations to come. Well, you mentioned the XL pipeline. Let me just say, Mr. Vice President, it was on day one of Joe Biden's presidency that he came in and started reversing all of your policies, along with President Trump's policies, and putting the climate change agenda as the priority. In the middle of all of this, Vice President Kamala Harris is uh, apparently going to Poland, and in doing so, she is continuing to push this switch to electric vehicles. Here's what the Vice President and said yesterday. Watch this. We are all in the midst of a turning point. We have the technology to transition to a zero emission fleet. We can address the climate crisis and grow our economy at the same time. She said her favorite subject is electric uh, school buses. 
<laughs> Maria, I, I have to tell you, the, uh, the, the dogged focus uh, of this administration uh, and, and the liberal left and the Democratic Party on their climate change green agenda, even in the face of a Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine, uh, it, it's just astonishing to me. I mean, the, 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 the idea that uh, they would see this as an opportunity to give even more impetus uh, to their green agenda. I mean, telling the American people that you can go out and buy a $75,000 electric car when gasoline is $4 a gallon, that that's somehow the solution is, it, it's pretty absurd. I mean, we, we know the pathway forward to American prosperity. It's American energy independence, and we know the pathway toward turning back the Russian aggression that is trampling innocent lives and ransacking across Russia, and that is to respond with American strength. Our economy is 15 times larger than the Russian economy. We were a net exporter of energy. We can impose an embargo on oil and natural gas from Russia. We can unleash American energy. Uh, we can turn back the tide of the Russian military by bringing economic pressure, for heaven's sakes. Uh, the time is now for this administration to at least take a time out on their climate change agenda and embrace American strength and American energy. Well, especially since we are in an energy crisis right now. Mr. Vice President, what more can be done at this point? You've met with President Zelensky. You know Vladimir Putin. Uh, can you talk to us a little about these gentlemen? I mean, Vladimir Putin... Uh, has has made demands, saying that he does not want uh, any NATO involvement whatsoever. He does not want uh, Ukraine to be part of NATO. What are your thoughts on Vladimir Putin right now and his mindset? Well, uh, having uh, having stood toe to toe with uh, President Putin myself, I can tell you, uh, Vladimir Putin only understands strength. And I truly do believe that uh, the reason why our administration is the only American administration in the 21st century where Putin did not try and, and grab land and redraw international borders by force is because he saw American strength. We rebuilt our military. We strengthened our, our common alliance. We called on NATO allies to invest more in our common defense. And, I, I, and, and, and we built up American energy and American energy exports all as we stood with our allies. I think it was that strength that was a that was a deterrence to Putin's ambitions and it's the pathway forward. But I must tell you, I did have the opportunity to spend time with President Zelensky. Uh, I must uh, uh, I, I have to tell you that I, uh, I I share the admiration of the world for his personal courage for the stand that he has taken. I, I have to believe uh, that Putin and the Russian military uh, got more than they bargained for with the strong Ukrainian people and with uh, the strength that President Zelensky has shown. And now is the time yeah. for the free world to stand with him to provide the Ukrainian military with the resources and equipment that they need to defend themselves and repel the Russian invasion. And more than anything else, we've got to impose that oil and natural gas embargo unleash American energy and call, as I did today here in Israel, and call on our allies around the world to join us to put a maximum pressure campaign on Russia. If I go back again, Maria. Uh, Vladimir Putin only understands strength and standing strong with the people of Ukraine, giving them the ability to defend themselves and, and redoubling our commitment uh, to a strong and prosperous uh, America is it's a pathway forward to stability in Europe and to the end of this unspeakable violence that's ransacking across Ukraine as we speak. And you are encouraging this and pushing energy independence in America. Is there anything else that the U.S. and NATO allies could be doing to help Ukraine? It is absolutely heartbreaking to watch this constant death and destruction now for 13 days. Well, it's so important to each of us. I, uh, I breathed a prayer today here in Israel. Uh, Karen and I visited the Western Wall. It's important that we pray for the people of Ukraine. But I want to say to all of my countrymen 
uh, back home. It's also important that we recognize that almost a million and a half Ukrainians have crossed the border, uh, are now in Hungary and in Poland. There are organizations like the International Red Cross, like Samaritan's Purse, and other relief organizations that are literally on the ground aiding those beleaguered families. And so while we call on this administration to take those steps that we know will demonstrate American strength uh, and utilize all the resources of American energy, pull together our allies to support Ukraine, uh, I just encourage every American to pray and, and as you're able to be generous to these organizations that have come alongside these beleaguered families and, uh, and let them know that the American people are with them to provide for them in their hour of need. Mr. Vice President, you were instrumental in the talks in the Middle East, of course, the Abraham Accords, as well as moving the embassy. Your thoughts on where we are today with Biden's foreign policy after the uh, botched Afghanistan withdrawal? We saw China and, and, and Russia partnering up on a number of levels. Well, there's no question that the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan has emboldened uh, the enemies of the United States and our adversaries around the world. Uh, but uh, now is the time for us to make it clear that we are going to stand with our allies and stand up to our enemies. I must tell you, uh, being here in Israel today, uh, my, uh, uh, my first time back since the Abraham Accords were signed to see the progress toward peace that happened under our administration. But it was all predicated, first and foremost, uh, on, on uh, the way that we isolated Iran as never before. That's why one of the reasons uh, I, I, I just, it's incomprehensible to me, Maria, that as we see war ravaging across Ukraine, a Russian invasion in Ukraine, that this administration continues not only its headlong rush on its climate change agenda, but a headlong rush to lift sanctions uh, on Iran and, in fact, uh, set the table to be buying oil uh, from Iran while we're cutting off uh, oil and gas exploration in the United States. We, we, have, we have got well, to seize on the progress that we made. It made peace possible with the Abraham Accords. And that's what I heard everywhere I've gone here in Israel. What do you want to hear from Germany? Of course, during your administration, uh, President Trump and yourself pushed Germany to pay more uh, in terms of NATO, to pay more for its own defense. In fact, it has now uh, announced it will increase defense spending. Are you vindicated? And what is the story in terms of Germany's pushback? It relies on Russian oil. Will that be the barrier to stopping Russian imports? Maria, there was so much criticism uh, of our administration when President Trump and I made it clear that we wanted our NATO allies to live up to their commitments. And you'll remember at, at the time, we, we saw $130 billion more in investment by our NATO allies in our common defense. Those are investments that are, that are contributing today to a stronger NATO. But the fact that uh, during our administration, Germany had had put a 10-year timeline, said it wouldn't be till 2030 that they would achieve that 2 percent goal that they had agreed to years earlier was a source of frustration. But I want to give Chancellor Schultz credit, uh, the people of Germany credit, uh, that now they've made that commitment uh, to spend 2 percent of their gross domestic product uh, on our common defense and uh, are also transferring weapons uh, to the people of Ukraine. Uh, uh, Germany right. is the economic powerhouse in so many ways of Europe, and to see Germany now stepping up uh, to assist us in providing for common defense, I mean, it's, it's one other way that, that Putin got more than he was bargaining for. I mean, I, I honestly think mm -hmm. he underestimated the courage of President Zelensky and the incredible courage of the Ukrainian people. But also, it's, it's, it's clear to many of us that Putin was anticipating division in the West. Uh, he, he saw yeah. NATO as a weakened alliance, but I believe the work that our administration did, the spade work of building up that alliance, making our expectations clear to NATO, has now yep. created an environment where NATO, frankly, has come together as never before. Uh, and, and to those who want to lay the blame 
for the Russian invasion in Ukraine on the expansion of NATO, I just simply ask, uh, where, where would our allies in Poland or uh, Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania be today yeah. if it were not for NATO? I mean, we've expanded the boundaries of freedom, Mr. Mr. Vice and President. we should continue to work to expand the boundaries of freedom in, in, in Europe and elsewhere around the world. 